Perfect. So um, once again, my name is Bailey Bostelman, and I am the Director of Chapter Engagement for the Foundation Fighting Blindness. Um, we at the Baltimore Chapter um, host these virtual activities um, periodically to help be able to provide resources to folks in the community. So we have um, two very special guests with us today. We have John Cornell, who is from the Foundation, as well as Janet Sines. Um, each of them are going to share with you a little bit about, um, for John, ways to get involved with the foundation. And then um, Janet Sines has a great presentation um, related to macular degeneration. So um, John, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to you to share a little bit about what you do at the foundation. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, I got my screen got <laughs> switched somehow. Am I close enough, Bailey? Is my voice coming through? Sometimes it doesn't. Yes, we can he hear you loud and clear. Loud and clear. Okay, great. Okay, so thank you everyone for attending this evening. How many are on the call? We have seven of us on the call. Seven, okay. So my name is John Corneal. At the foundation, my title is Director of Legacy Giving. Does If I say a legacy gift, does anyone on the call know what, what that means? Or think they know what it means? Okay. Um, so when I talk about a legacy gift, what I'm referring to is somebody who leaves a gift leaves a gift to us through their will or a trust or beneficiary designation of an account, a life insurance policy. Basically, it's a gift that comes to us upon the death of one of our donors. And you know, my being here in this call this evening is a kind of a new thing because although we have received legacy gifts to the foundation virtually in the entire 50 years that we've been in existence, we haven't really focused on promoting them as a way to really support the organization, well, maybe until the last, the last 10 years or so, seriously. But what I want you to know is that it's a huge potential revenue source to the foundation. And that's what we're all about. While tonight, you're going to hear a presentation about some science, and part of our mission is public awareness and education, which is a lot of what our chapter program is about. What we're mainly in existence for is to raise money, to fund research. So those of us on this call that have uh, vision loss, myself included, I'm almost totally blind from retinitis pigmentosa. Um, so we fund the research to bring treatments and cures to those of us who are affected and future generations. So when you think about it, everybody's situation is different as far as what they're able to give themselves during their lifetime. Uh, you have kids, maybe you've lost a job, struggling with work, or you get to retirement and the whole income situation changes. All of those things and many, many more play a factor in how much a person is able to give during their lifetime. And some are not able to give at all financially. So you know, then you, we'd hope you could give your time to raise uh, awareness of the foundation, raise money from other people. But when, you, when you're at death, you don't need your money anymore. So what I like to say is that not, while not everyone can make a financial gift during their lifetime, just about everybody has the ability to make a legacy gift in some way, shape, or form. And... There's, there's many, many different ways to think about it. Um, you know, for your own benefit, lots of people I've, I've heard over the years, well, why, I don't have an estate. I don't, I'm not a wealthy person. Why should I do any estate planning? Well, the truth is that everybody has an estate because an estate is really just a fancy legal term for what if you have an, something of value at the time of your death. 
if the only thing that a person died with was a painting on the wall, their estate would consist of the painting on the wall. And without planning ahead of time before you die, you would have no control over where that painting ended up. So that's what it's really all about. So everyone who's on this call should be thinking for themselves, for their family, about end of life uh, issues. Whether they're, where you fall in failing health and you need somebody to help make medical decisions for you or help with finances, and then certainly upon death so that you control whatever you have, you have control over where it goes. If you don't have a will or some other plan in place um, where a will wouldn't be necessary, then the state where you live when you die will dictate where your property goes. And most people don't want that. You work hard during your lifetime to accumulate things and you really should want to control where those things go. So the most common way that we receive uh, gifts at death is through somebody's will. Either leave a specific dollar amount to the foundation or a percentage of whatever their estate consists of. People, a lot of people have trusts, can also leave a percentage amount of a trust or a specific dollar amount. Many people have 401k plans, IRAs, life insurance policies, stock accounts, anything that has an uh, ability to name a beneficiary, sometimes even checking accounts, savings account, you can do that type of thing. You can add whoever you want to receive those uh, assets in those accounts as a beneficiary. And our hope is that, and really what the philosophy has been since I've been with the foundation for now 12 years doing this, is to encourage everyone to think about these issues. Like I said, when I started, you should be thinking about it for yourself and your family. And then what we hope is that while you're thinking about putting your end of life plan together, you remember what the foundation has meant to you. For me, it's really become a life-changing uh, part of my family. The people that I've met through the foundation, I was a volunteer before I joined the foundation as a staff member. I used to attend chapter meetings like this as a, an attendee, as a volunteer. And the people that I've met, the support that I've gotten through staff members and other people affected all over the country has really been life-changing for me. I'm 62 years old. Uh, like I said, I'm almost, almost totally blind. I still hold out hope, of course, like all of us do for treatments and cures. And even if it does happen or it doesn't happen, I've met a lot of families who have children, next generation, where I wanna leave something back. So I've put this publicly out there. I've created a legacy gift. My legacy gift is in the form of the actual, the retirement account that we have through the foundation. It's very similar to a 401k, except for a not-for-profit, they call it a 403b plan. So I've named the foundation as the beneficiary of my 403B plan. I have two children, two adult daughters. I've provided for them in other ways. Uh, a very good friend of mine, um, we've publicized her story. She has three adult children. She also has RP. She's leaving 10% of whatever she has left at the time of her death to the foundation because it really, she views it as the foundation really being part of her family. So. I'm going to check. I want to be very mindful of our time. Um, there's much, much more to say about this. I want you to know that I'm here as a resource at the foundation. Uh, if you ever want to think about this, talk about this. I was an attorney before I joined the foundation. I, while I can't prepare documents or wills or anything for you or really give legal advice, I definitely can talk to you about these issues. Um, and we also have a, a campaign going on now. We have, to, we have a Victory for Vision campaign where we're trying to raise $75 million in real money. But for the first time ever in the 50-year his, history of the foundation, we have a legacy gift component to this campaign. So part of this campaign of the $75 million is to, to identify $30 million of legacy gifts. And that would be like by me. I, I created this gift through my 403B account. I've notified us, the staff internally, of what I think the value of that is. And that value gets counted toward the campaign. 
So if you do this, you're not only benefiting the foundation uh, for future generations, but you're also helping for this currently for this campaign that we have ongoing. And I just want to leave, um, like I said, tons more to say, but uh, does anyone have any questions? Nothing, no question is off limits. Okay, that's fine. Please know that I'm here. There's, I think uh, Bailey has my contact information is in the agenda. Um, if not, just reach out to her um, or any of the chapter leaders. They have a way to get a hold of me at the foundation. And again, I, I thank you very much for participating, listening, and considering uh, leaving the foundation as part of your legacy. Thank you so much, John. And welcome, I will baby. include your email in the chat feature so that um, everyone has that as well. Um, but then, um, like John said, um, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to reach out to um, me and I can connect you with John or reach out to John directly. Um, we really appreciate you sharing with us a little bit about legacy. Um, mm -hmm. It is definitely a a vital piece of our organization as we're looking to uh, continue to fund research even um, past these 50 years we that we've just accomplished. We wanna add 50 more years to that as well. So um, thank you, John, and we really appreciate Welcome. the work you're doing. Okay, I'm gonna jump off and have a great rest of the meeting, everyone. Sounds great, thanks so much. Okay, good night. Great, well, um, we um, are, are, once again, very excited to have all of you with us. Um, we have Dr. Janet Sunness here with us um, to share with us a little bit more about um, macular degeneration. So Janet, I'm gonna go ahead and just toss it over to you and um, you can share your screen whenever you're ready and um, begin with your piece. Okay, thank you. No, anymore. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, say hello to my patients and friends who I see are on the line tonight. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. <laughs> That's frozen something right there. <laughs> you didn't do it. No. Okay, let me just. Okay. What I'm going to talk about tonight is um, dry age-related macular degeneration. I see it from a few different angles. First of all, I'm a medical retina specialist, so I've treated patients with this. Um, I'm a low vision specialist, so I work on ways we can help people use their vision better with magnification, lighting, and all sorts of different um, interventions. And I've also done um, research in um, dry macular degeneration. I was um, from 1992 to 2000, I was at Wilmer and I was um, the director of an NIH funded natural history study of advanced macular degeneration, which is called geographic atrophy, the advanced dry part. Um, and this was funded by the National Eye Institute. And I also got some funding from research to prevent blindness. I'm a member of the Foundation Fighting Blindness Scientific Advisory Board, and I'm chair of the Data Safety Monitoring Board for the a trial of uh, using stem cells to see if we can um, uh, halt or slow the progression of this disease. I'm going to use PowerPoint slides, but I'm going to say everything also. So for those of you who can't see it that well, you're not really going to miss anything. Okay, so first of all, the macula is the center part of the retina. It's only a small part of the retina though, because as you can see on the left, what happens is the, the, the small area of the macula, and then there's a large area of retina around it. So when we, I'm sorry, when we normally talk about um, the macula, we, we see this image. This is only the small, center part of the image. So we need the macula and the center of the macula is called the fovea. We need that for seeing fine detail, for reading, for recognizing faces and so forth. The remainder, the large peripheral area that's present is, um, is what we use for walking around and getting peripheral 
information. Macular degeneration generally is limited to the macula, and so it does not affect one's ability to see um, peripherally, one's ability to walk around. People do not go blind from, um, from macular degeneration, but they do lose significant amounts of central, central vision loss. Okay. Now this is um, a schematic drawing of the various cells that are involved in the retina and in particular for macular degeneration. There's what are called the photoreceptors or the rods and the cones. Those are the cells that catch the light and then they send the signal to the nerve layers of the retina, which ultimately goes out of the eye and into the brain. But sustaining those cells is a layer called the retinal pigment epithelium. That um, nourishes the cells in a sense, it prevents blood vessels from getting through abnormal blood vessels. And it's needed there. If those cells die off, the overlying photoreceptors also die off and you end up getting um, blind spots in the vision. And what happens in macular degeneration is that these um, these retinal pigment epithelial cells, the so-called so supporting cells, let's say, they end up accumulating a lot of um, material which ends up causing them to degenerate. When they degenerate, you get um, either new blood vessels growing through, which is what's called wet macular degeneration, or you get the cells dying off and you end up with blind spots in the vision. It's very confusing in a sense um, talking about dry macular degeneration because people will come out of a doctor's office and they'll say, I have dry macular degeneration. And it could mean they have excellent vision, maybe just a little trouble in the dark. And they have the earliest stages of macular degeneration, which um, don't cause vision loss. Or it could be that they have most of the macula involved and, and they're legally blind. So people get scared um, when they hear the words macular degeneration, but most people have the early dry form that doesn't progress, that, that doesn't end up reaching the, the level of causing legal blindness. Now, I, I'm showing on the right um, a picture of the macula and then what's called the OCT, which is like a cross-sectional view of the retina. And on the top is a, a normal view. You see that the the center of the fovea looks like a little valley. Um, the cells are sort of pushed away and that's the way it should look normally. And you can see underneath there's like a, a line going um, across underneath. That's looking at the outer portion of the light sensing cells and the retinal pigment epithelium. Now, when you have drusen or these little yellow deposits, you see little bumps in the, in the layer underneath the retina. And when you have more of them, you can see that they can clump up and, and cause a lot of change. But none of these patients would have significant vision loss. But when we get to advanced dry macular degeneration, otherwise known as geographic atrophy, then we're already experiencing significant loss of vision. I think it's called geographic because if, if you look at a picture of the, of the atrophy, um, in the context of the whole macula, it looks like a continent. It looks like it's very separate and different from, from the rest of the retina. And that is true. It looks much lighter and you can see the vessels that are below um, coming through. You see, you see that very well. And it's very easy to diagnose this condition. I'm gonna talk toward the end about um, some treatments that are being tried for this right now, it's not critical for people to, for doctors to really even make a, a distinction about geographic atrophy because there's nothing to do for it. But hopefully in the future, there are going to be treatments and it's going to be important to understand what's going on. So in this condition, you end up losing that white line and you just end up getting an area that is blind and has what we call atrophy in it. Just, wet macular degeneration is different because in that condition, there's abnormal blood vessels that grow under the retina that bleed and leak and scar. Unlike geographic atrophy, the wet macular degeneration generally starts in the center in the fovea. So there's a loss of vision 
and the ability to read a chart early on, as we'll see in, in geographic atrophy, that's not exactly the case. And there is treatment now for wet macular degeneration, injections into the eye of um, medications, drugs that block sort of these new blood vessels from growing. And it's important to know that basically all wet macular degeneration starts from dry macular degeneration. In other words, the presence of these deposits under the retina that shows that the cells are sort of getting weakened and that's the, uh, the substrate, that's the condition in which these new blood vessels come across. So the wet macular degeneration develops from people who have dry macular degeneration. They're not necessarily, they're not totally separate things. Geographic atrophy is present in about three and a half percent of people 75 year old, years old and older, but it increases to about 25% of people over 90. So it's very common. And currently it's estimated in the United States is 1.8 million people who have this condition, but it's projected that by 2050 with aging of the population, there probably will be 5.4 million. Um, it's more common in white people and people who have blue eyes rather than brown eyes and um, smoking increases the risk of getting it and the risk of progressing. So that is a risk factor that can be modified that people can actually do something about. This shows the progression of geographic atrophy over a 10 year period. In the first image, the patient had some drews in these yellow deposits and some changes in pigment, but had good vision, no blind spots. And then he evolved to having two areas of atrophy and blind spots. Then after that, those two areas enlarged and he started getting some underneath the center, those enlarged and, and joined the others. So you end up with sort of a horseshoe of, um, blind area, but still sparing the center. The center is still spared. Um, and that goes into having a ring actually of blinds, but just sparing a small area. And finally, the center area gets destroyed and the person is legally blind. So this is the so-called classic appearance of geographic atrophy. It develops with little areas of blind spot um, occurring, enlarging, sparing the center of the fovea till late. But the thing is, the, so those people can still read a letter chart and they can have good vision. However, the visual acuity doesn't really capture the impairment that's caused by geographic atrophy. And the reason is this, people who have geographic atrophy, as I showed in the previous slide, have, they may have a spared area here, for example, so they can read a letter chart. However, a word, or a face can't fit in this area so that people are, you know, they, they can read a chart, but they can't read words, they have difficulty. This is a patient who has just a little, little spirit area with a large area of blind spot around it. It's, it impairs the person a lot, even though, you know, they can still read a chart. One of the ways I try to get a sense of what's, what the patients are seeing, and in particular, I try to teach patients what they have is I do something called face fields. I tell the patient, I cover one eye at a time. I want them to look at my nose so they can see my nose as clearly as they can. While they're looking at my nose, I want them to tell me, is there part of my face that's missing or blurry or distorted? So this patient told me, I can see your nostrils, but everything else is, is blurred. And she had one of these conditions, like I showed on the last slide, where like a a ring of blind spot around just a small spared area. The geographic atrophy is very symmetrical between eyes so that it's, um, you know, you're losing, in essence, you, you're getting blind spots in both eyes at the same time. What's an advantage, if you want to call it that, is that if we're doing a treatment that involves an injection into an eye, you can really use the fellow eye, the other eye as a comparison to see is this treatment working to slow down the rate of progression of the geographic atrophy. So when we look at um, people who start off with geographic atrophy and good vision, about 25% of them became legally blind four years later. So here's an example. This patient started out again with 
two areas of atrophy with the center spared and visual acuity about 2025. In other words, just one line worse than normal. It evolved into a ring two years later, but the patient still had excellent visual acuity. And then by four years, they lost the center and became legally blind. People who have macular degeneration, but especially geographic atrophy, have a marked reduction of function when it's when in dim illumination. It's critical, critical for them to get good light. And you know, sometimes we think, well, lighting is no big deal, but it is a really big deal for them. And one of the ways we try to quantify this to get a measure of this is we have the patient read um, a standard uh, letter chart and measure their vision and got their best correction, their best prescription on. And then we put on a um, like a moderate sunglass over the eye and we had them read it again. Now, this is sort of uh, vaguely, you know, sort of trying to give a depiction of what they saw. So when I do that in front of my eye, I can see down to the bottom of the chart. It does not affect me. And when people who are similarly aged to the people who were in this study and had, had advanced macular degeneration, they just worsened by about two lines. But people who have geographic atrophy worsened by an average of five lines. And some of them who could see um, see even very small letters in the light, they, they couldn't even see the top line of the chart when, the, when it was dim. So it's really a, a tremendously important thing that they get good lighting and that um, they avoid you know, driving at night in areas that would um, not provide enough lighting for them. When we, we administered a questionnaire to people and the, the things that they reported the most difficulty was reading small print, identifying faces, dim illumination and driving. There is no treatment currently for dry macular degeneration. There is what's called the ARIDS-2 formulation. There was a big study of people who had earlier macular degeneration to see if you could change the rate of developing late macular degeneration with vision loss. And it turns out that the ARIDS formulation reduces the risk of getting wet macular degeneration by about 25%, but it has no effect on getting geographic atrophy or on the progression of geographic atrophy. So currently there is really no treatment for, um, for geographic atrophy, but there is low vision intervention. We can help people use their vision much more effectively. So first of all, it's wonderful because there are many mainstream devices that are very, very helpful to people who have geographic atrophy. You can use a cell phone, you can magnify it, you can, it has good contrast so you can see, you know, bold letters and you can, you can see the text white on black or black on white. And nowadays there are free apps that can do so many things for you. There's, there's one that's called Seeing AI, you just say, Hey Siri, recognize document and it reads it to you. There's another one called Be My Eyes, which if, if somebody has very poor vision and they're in they're somewhere and they don't know where they are exactly or they don't know what they're looking at, they can um, activate this app and there are volunteers all over the world who will look at what their camera is transmitting and tell the person what they're seeing and so forth. Um, Tablets, Kindles, iPads, et cetera, are excellent for reading because again, you can enhance the contrast. You can make it as big as you need it and um, you can display it in ways that are tremendously helpful. Um, there are many ways now to use um, speech to use your phone or to speak into a computer and record what you're doing. and. And likewise, the reverse, the text to speech where the computer or the phone can read um, what's there. So that's a tremendous help. There are GPS systems that not only help for driving, but they help someone walking around to know where they actually are. Um, and there are many other devices that are mainstream. So mainstream devices are great because first of all, they tend to be less expensive than standard low vision devices. And, in addition, they, you look like everybody else when you're looking at your telephone, everybody's doing that. So um, that's very nice. Now, there are um, 
specific low vision devices. And these include various types of magnifiers, um, portable video magnifiers. So that sort of works like the camera on a cell phone. Um, there are new devices that are, I consider them sort of in the second generation. They're not quite there yet in terms of um, being totally useful. They, this is one of them where the person basically is wearing a, a cell phone that's in a, you know, a headset for it. They're actually looking in the cell phone and getting virtual reality. That is what's there gets um, captured by a, a camera and it's projected on the screen for the eyes and you can make it larger and bolder and many, do many other things, but it's still not quite there. People are also working on devices like that, virtual reality devices that um, are more like glasses and you can both look out and see what, what's out there and look at the screen and see. And there are various types of telescopes uh, at, at the right, it's a patient of mine who, who wore um, telescopes to, to uh, magnify things. And besides magnification, there are many other things we can do, improving lighting, um, improving contrast using bold pens, um, use, you know, marking steps so that it's easier to see and go down. Now, the, the biggest thing that's important though is to make the patient aware of where they have the blind spot. I talk about um, macular degeneration as needing three things. You need things bigger, you need things bolder, but you also have to be aware of the bolder, B-O-U-L-D-E-R, the, the blind spot in the vision. And the problem is that if the brain showed a, a dark splotch where there was a blind spot, that would be easy. The person would say, oh, there's my blind spot. I can't see there. I'm gonna to have to move my eyes to see it. But the brain does not do that. The brain tries to put together sort of a unified image. So the person is not really aware of what they're missing. So this is this is a what I think is a very good example of this. It's uh, from a book about glaucoma, but it gives a very good picture of what's going on. So this is a person with normal vision, and they're, here's they're on a street, and there's a woman crossing the street, the car here, a building, etc. Now this person below has a blind spot up and to the left, and that person does not see the woman and does not see the car because the brain sort of fills it in as best as it can. And it just, um, that's not there anymore. And it's really important for a patient to learn where they're missing things, both in terms of reading, in terms of we can talk about driving later if you'd like in the question period, but in terms of driving, et cetera, because people have to know how to, how to compensate for the blind spot. There are a number of clinical trials going on for geographic atrophy. Some of them relate to what's called the complement system, which is the system the body uses for fighting inflammation or for getting inflammation to help combat um, disease and so forth. However, it can end up depositing things and, and causing inflammatory cells to actually um, work against the retina and maybe cause macular degeneration. So there are two companies, one is Apelis and one is Iberic Bio, which have um, complement devices. They have to be injected into the eye and they seem to slow the rate of enlargement of geographic atrophy. So that remains to be seen exactly what's going to happen with them. As I mentioned before, there are, there are stem cell trials, which basically are transforming stem cells into that layer of cells below the retina, the retinal pigment epithelium, and transplanting, um, injecting under the retina, under the nerve tissue, um, injecting a bunch of cells or a patch that's containing these cells and seeing how that, how that helps. And so that also is in early stages. Um, there are other, other things that, that might be helpful in the, the thing that accumulates in the, in the cells, the retinal pigment epithelial cells are derivatives of vitamin A. And there are some kinds of variants of vitamin A that don't clump that much and maybe um, will lessen the amount that's, that's causing the degeneration. There are various slits about the mitochondria, which are the oxygen using um, 
energy producing parts of the cell and maybe those are affected. And there are some studies looking, some clinical trials looking at that. And there are clinical trials looking at possible DNA and RNA um, ways of getting around uh, geographic atrophy. In other words, using genetic um, methods for doing it. There's also something we call artificial retinas or retinal prostheses. What that means is that the layers that the that are abnormal in um, in geographic atrophy and also in RP as well are the back layers, the layer that catches the light, the light sensing layer or the rods and cones, the photoreceptor layer. And that layer is only one of 10 layers of the retina. The other, what that layer catches the light and then it sends the signal into the nerve layers that then process the information and send it to the brain. So if you have geographic atrophy or you have RP, what's getting affected are the layers that catch the light. But, this, but the neurological, the um, nerve network that has to get into the brain, that's intact. So if now if you could substitute a sensor for the cells that are no longer sensing things and get that sensor to send the message to this nerve network, you could restore some vision. And there are some, um, some companies that are looking at that. that right now is also in its early stages, but it can restore a little bit of vision. Um, right now, it would not be useful for people with geographic atrophy because the amount of vision it restores is actually less than, the, than um, what the person currently has. But in the future, that may be a way of, of helping people. And finally, I wanna talk about visual hallucinations. I try to talk about this in every talk I give about geographic atrophy and other diseases. There's something called the Charles Bonnet syndrome. And it's visual hallucinations that are caused specifically by, by retinal and macular disease. The thought is that um, the brain is trying to compensate for input it's not getting from the eyes and people see all kinds of things. And it's really very common. It's 20 to 30% of patients with macular degeneration have this. I try to tell every patient about it to tell their doctors and so forth because um, often a person will think they're going crazy or they're afraid to tell their, their children or their, um, you know, their relatives about it because they think their relatives are gonna think they're going nuts. But it really is an entity and people see all kinds of things. I have one patient who, um, who has macular degeneration who sees people. So when she sees somebody in her apartment, she goes to the door to make sure no one's broken in, says hello to them and gets back to doing her thing. And these things are very common and it's important to know that they do happen just on the basis of macular degeneration alone. So I hope I've given you a little introduction to geographic atrophy. Um, and I'd like to emphasize the points first that, that dry macular degeneration um, is a spectrum, in other words, starting from uh, a stage where there's very little impact on the vision, going all the way to having people be legally blind, that in geographic atrophy, you can have people read small print, but they may not be able to see a face or um, read a whole word at a time, and they may have reading difficulties. And you know, there are there are various clinical trials that are being tried to see if we can help in that disease. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you so much for that. That was. Um, that was wonderful. Um, does anyone have any questions? Feel free to come off mute if you're muted um, and just um, ask away. Are there any clinical trials in the Baltimore area? Yes. Yeah, there are. Um... There are a number of trials at Hopkins, at Wilmer, and there are trials at various um, private practices, retinal practices as well. If you're interested, you could email me, um, jfunis at 
gbmc.org. Um, and I could tell you some of them. I know that there are several retinal practices in Baltimore that have that have these. Okay. And there are some, the other thing that's interesting is besides the injections into the eye, there are some oral medications that are being tried. It's a very difficult thing because in wet macular degeneration, there's already fluid and bleeding. And when you treat them, you can get that fluid to go away and you can actually improve vision. In geographic atrophy, the cells are already gone. So the treatment that you do is not going to restore any vision. The only thing it's going to do is prevent um, further progression or slow down the progression. So it's a hard thing to sort of come to terms with. I'm gonna get injections into my eye for the rest of my life um, because maybe that will slow down the disease. And it's really hard to, to know yet. People are wondering, you know, how are people go, how are patients going to um, factor this out in their head to determine whether it's worth doing or not. It's, it's um, you know, it's a difficult question. Thank you. So if there are no other questions, I want to talk a little bit about driving. Do we have time, Bailey? We okay. do, yes. Okay. Um, so in Maryland, if you have um, a full visual field. In other words, you can see fully out to the side and you have visual acuity, the ability to read a chart of 2040 or better. That means you can read um, letters that are twice as big as the normal. Then you can just go to a, go to a branch, which maybe you could do before COVID anyway, um, go to a branch, take their vision test, get your license and be done. If you're worse than that, then up to a certain level, up to 2070, which is three and a half times the normal size. Volunteer fighters to join and help with the fighters in Ukraine. I guess somebody has to move. Yeah. Um, if then a doctor can sign off on it. I can sign off this person is 2070 or better. But the question is, as I showed you in the earlier slide, the macula, let's say somebody has macular degeneration, it's really only a small little area compared to the whole retina. So the question is, if you have a loss of vision in that area, do, how much is that really affecting your driving? Because it's a very small amount relative to the whole field. So um, there is a program, I'm also on the medical advisory board of the Maryland MVA, and there's a program for letting people have vision that's a little bit worse than the normal standard if they're willing to go through um, training and some testing and so forth. So um, many people, most people with geographic atrophy who are still driving have stopped driving at night for the reason that I said before, because their, their night vision, their vision and dim illumination is very poor but many of them can continue driving during the day. And I try to help people, to enable people to drive if, if they can drive safely, because it really gives a measure of independence that they wouldn't have otherwise. And most people are only driving, you know, to a store, to their daughter's house or to a church or whatever. They're not driving miles and miles on a highway. So just giving them that little benefit really makes a tremendous difference and their independence, their ability to stay in their home and to do things. Great, do we have any other questions? You know, I'll say one other thing, as long as there are no questions. Um, the geographic atrophy that I spoke about uh, tonight is very similar to some other conditions. So for example, um, there's Stargardt disease, which is juvenile macular degeneration, but it causes a similar thing. It causes a loss of the central vision. And many of the things I've said about geographic atrophy apply to that. And there are a number of other, there's um, some, some diseases of the retina caused by medications and things like that that also work the same way. Okay.
Well, thank you for all of this um, valuable information. Um, I, I know I personally learned a lot, so I hope that um, all of our guests learned a lot as well. Um, we will um, send out the recording so that if anyone missed any pieces of it, that they'll be able to um, catch up on it. Um, or if you found that this was a valuable session and you wanna share it with friends or family, feel free to do that as well. Um, uh, would it be okay if I provided your contact, your email to the group as well in the follow-up? Okay. Sure. Perfect. That way, if there's any questions that come up as you're um, re-watching the recording or um, if you get off here today and want to ask something that um, is maybe more personal that you didn't want to ask in front of the group, then um, we can do that as well. Perfect. Well, um, we really appreciate everybody joining us. Um, if there's no other questions or comments, then um, we can let everyone enjoy the rest of their evening. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you all so much and have a great rest of your week. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.